You are officially invited. Yes, you. You're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery. This is my 10-week program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start on October 9th. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program to reserve your spot today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 222. Welcome to the 222nd episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source of information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. In today's episode, I have an on-air client session with one of my clients, Daisy, and uh, we actually recorded the session right after we finished our group program. So I think it was like a day or two uh, after our 10 weeks together had finished. So by the time we recorded this, Daisy and I had been together for nearly three months in the program. And uh, she shares some of the challenges that that she's had. So Daisy's had a number of different challenges, not only related to fertility, but also just related to menstrual cycle health. So uh, we get into a lot of that and also some of the things that she can pay attention to. And especially for those of you who are trying to conceive, this is a great episode because we really get into the importance of cervical mucus, but also the importance of timing. So I know you're going to love it. And for those of you looking to deepen your fertility awareness knowledge and really gain that confidence to chart your cycles, registration is still open for my 10-week fertility awareness mastery group program. So we're actually starting in a couple weeks here. Our first session is going to be October the 9th, 2018. So if you're listening in real time and you're wanting to join us, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program to apply to make sure that we can reserve your spot. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. Now let's jump into today's episode. And in today's episode, I'm really excited to welcome Daisy to the show. Uh, Daisy was a member of my most recent 10-week Fertility Awareness Mastery group program. And as we recording this, we actually just finished yesterday, or not yesterday, the day before yesterday. So we actually finished our 10 weeks two days ago. Um, So thank you so much for coming on the show, Daisy. Hi, thank you for having me, Lisa. (laughs) I'm glad to have you on the show. And as we were chatting a little bit in the pre-chat, so I like to start just by giving the listeners a sense of uh, your history. So your birth control history, you know, menstruation. So maybe you could tell us when you first got your period and if you've ever used hormonal birth control and kind of what led you, what has led up to this point. Okay, so I believe I got my period at the age of 12. I remember so clear. I was uh, I was in a Catholic school and I was taking my courses to do my um, my confirmation. So my dad was the fortunate person that I find out for the very first time that I just recently became a girl. <laughs> so it was very emotional. I went until I was 17 with my periods fine, no pain. I had some acne. And um, at the age of 19, my acne was out of control. And uh, I decided to go to the uh, BGYN, and he recommended me to take birth control pills, which I did for about eight to nine years. In the process of that time, I normally will get frequently UTIs, these infections, almost very like every three months, six months, it was just annoying. So after a while, I said, all right, I'm going to stop taking the birth control pills on my own. And I said, I'm going to just give my time, so my body, I'm sorry, to have some time to detox. And um, I went without it for about two years. During that period, my acne came in like a horrible way. I had this cystic acne on my chin, on my cheeks. It was like these bruises and there were like bumps, like huge bumps. They were just, they were horrible. And I don't like to use this word, but they look disgusting. It was horrible. And 
it was nothing that I could do. Like I tried cream, soaps, anything under the earth that I will clear my acne, but it will make it worse. And I only got it on my face, not anywhere else. My The rest of my body was fine. But my nutrition was not the best. I did not have a good lifestyle because I used to party a lot. I used to go out dancing, stay up late, eat whatever. You know, I was like in my 20s, skinny little thing. I didn't worry about exercising or sleeping. I thought I was invisible. <laughs> Superwoman, you know, just having fun. And, uh, and once I start facing this this monster of the acne monster, I will call, it really brought me to my sense. And I said, I have to do something because I can't be living like this. And I will like hide my face with lots of makeup. I will cover my face with like my hair. And the worst part is that I work in the dentist's office, so I couldn't wear all of that to work. And I worked directly like face to face with them and that was I would cry every day when I was at work because I didn't want I felt so self-conscious that really like that really affect me emotionally and and physically you know and I tried so many OBGYNs oh so many dermatologists so I got to the point my last research I took this very strong medication for acne and um they forced me to take birth control pills with it because if I would have gotten pregnant with that, then I would have such a bad pregnancy and also the baby would have some sort of deformation or something from the medication. And of course, it was such a strong medication. And the birth control pills and and this medication really threw my body so many ways that I I couldn't, I wasn't functioning right like a person. I I think I was going crazy because... Were you having like emotional effects from the... Very, yeah. I was very depressed. I would cry every day for no reason. I will be so aggravated out of the most insignificant thing that will cross on the moment. It was like a high and low, but like very strong. It was high, high, low, low. And um, I was just, I just did, I just didn't feel a purpose of living anymore. It was just, I never thought about that before. And well, and tell us about your cycles during this time. So oh. you, there was a period of time. I mean, like, I can't imagine what it would have been like for you all those years with the acne. I mean, it sounds like the worst case scenario. And then in the midst of all of that, so because I know a little bit of background about your cycles. So you had taken birth control, and then you went off of it, and then you were put back on it because you were on that heavy medication for your acne. So tell us just a little bit about what your cycles were like throughout this time. So while I was on my birth control pills, my periods came very light on the clock, obviously. Everything was perfect, no pain, nothing. After I came, after I stopped taking them, I started missing periods for two, three months. Then I will get them in two months. I will get them three times. But I did not have that much pain. Like, they were missing periods. So I went to an endocrinologist, and he diagnosed me with a PCOS. So once I have that diagnosed, I figure, okay, that's why I'm getting the cysts and the missing periods. And once again, I went back and worked on a diet. But my periods came out worse. After a while, they, it was something I never experienced before because as older I was started to get, the more painful they will get, you know, uh, to the point that I will have to call in sick to work because I was in excruciating pain and like in the mid section of my belly, I feel like if I will like get up and walk, it felt like it was going to fall out of my body, like whatever it was inside of me. I will say my uterus. That's, that's the feeling I got that every time I will get it or like if someone was like stabbing me in my ovaries or like burning pain, my back to the point that I could even like to, uh, tie my shoes, like that was not normal. And I used to get very he- heavy periods as well. And when I will get them heavy, I will know that I also have some either on the right or the left side ovary, I will get this very painful cyst to the point I thought I had an appendicitis once 
I was going to record it. Uh, I went to the doctor first because it was like on my way to work. And I said, I'm not going to the hospital. And the doctor, sure enough, she did a, a, a note for something. She's like, no, it just, it just just burst a, a cyst. That's all it is. That's what the pain is from. You're fine. I'm like, I can't believe this pain is so bad. Like, I can't function. I, I couldn't even think from the pain. And for many, many years, I will say about three years, my life and uh, it was just from this nonsense of painful periods and just missing periods and all those things. Well, and you, in, uh, so in the most recent years, you've been trying to conceive. And so when you joined the program, you mentioned that it had been about five years of trying to conceive. So maybe just tell us a little bit about, like, did this overlap during, was it around the same time that you were experiencing this pain and um, the pain with ovulation? Uh, yeah, I I have to say that I, if I recall, I think since 2015, we started to try. Obviously, ignorance comes, it plays a big role. I thought you can get pregnant anytime around the month. <laughs> and little by little, I learned, I learned that our body does not work that way. And you, you need to ovulate, you need to so many things before you even start uh, thinking of that, of the, of start have, making a baby. It was challenging because I had so much stress over my phase and my periods that having a baby was a priority, but it was like put on the back. You know, I said, I can't do this. There's too many things. I have to heal myself first or find what is triggering my body to to do these things to me. And um, it didn't matter what kind of vitamins I took I have so many vitamins sitting on my counter space that honestly I don't even know what they're good for until I finally found uh, a natural technology doctor and uh, um, I'm, and I'm talking about like wandering around from doctor to doctor at least four years in between this whole process of going to see an specialist, fertility, and I did not like him because he treated me like I would be a cow or something that, you know, hello here, we need to get you pregnant, here's your medication, you take it, and not giving me an answer of why is the reason that I can't get pregnant. You know, um, I was healthy back then. I mean, I was just 29 years old. I never had any any strong disease that I could say, okay, this could prevent, this could stop me from getting pregnant. So, so far it was very frustrating that I was healthy, but no way I could get pregnant. And uh, I think it was more emotionally and mentally that affected me from there. Mm -hmm. Well, and so fast forward to now. So you are working with I mean, there's there's a lot. I, I feel like in in your case, as we go through your story, there's so many layers to it: uh, the chronic acne, and then painful periods, and painful ovulation, and also years of of trying to conceive in the midst of all of that. So you've been through a lot, Daisy. Yeah. So when you joined the program, I remember one of the things that you said to me, Daisy, was that you know this was all new to you. So you had fin- like you c- kind of finally discovered this whole charting thing and being able to track your cycles. And also working with a NAPRO doctor means that part of your, part of the exchange that you have with your doctor whenever you go is specifically about your chart. And so you have to actually be charting in a specific way so that they can monitor and kind of schedule your treatment around your charts, which is great, right? You're in the fantastic alternate universe of (laughs) medical uh, care where the chart actually is central to it. So let's shift a little bit to the charting part, because I want to make sure you get a part of a session on our on-air call today. But tell me, what are some of the the questions that you have or some of the topics that you want to make sure that we cover in our time together? I have to say that cervical mucus is the most challenging thing to learn. And as much as I keep asking, I'm not sure if my body's being a little stubborn and it doesn't want to produce any. And it's giving me a hard time, but trying to identify that is the most challenging thing because, you know, you wipe, you see, you try to go with everything that, you know, that I was told on your class and I get it. But when it comes to seeing and looking and trying to identify, it's like, what do I call it? Like, is it shiny? Is it not shiny? Is it wet? Is damp? 
so I'm trying as my best. I have to say my cervical mucus, that's one of the things I'm learning as I'm going, even though it's very challenging that I'm not producing much. Mm-hmm. I have more dry days. I noticed that. And obviously that's not normal. So now my challenge is uh, how do we get to producing more? Yes, of course. And so, I mean, there's always a couple things I want to talk about whenever this comes up. The first thing is that often we have this expectation that we're going to have all these days of mucus. Right. So that's kind of the first thing because so in a, in a healthy cycle, we would expect to see anywhere from say about three to seven days of mucus. And as we get older, we would expect to not see as many days. So it's quite just normal and natural. It's just a natural part of the aging process for there to be fewer days of mucus. And your mucus production can be affected by a number of different things. It can be affected by history of birth, uh, hormonal birth control use. Sometimes it could take a little bit of time for it to rebound after you come off of those. But I think that the first thing is to set the expectation that you're not going to have like, well, you shouldn't have like 20 days. (laughs) <laughs> like of like dri- like it's dripping out of you all the time. So let's talk a little bit about your previous chart. So I have up your chart. So I have the one from August to September here, and you have several days marked of mucus. So tell me about this cycle, your last cycle. So did you have any days where you observed mucus that was clear and stretchy? Yes, I had two days. I remember, I'm sorry, one day. Because it was the the it was clear, stretchy, slippery. I couldn't barely like pick it out from the tissue though. I just went and sensed it and tried to like uh, finger test, but they didn't really stretch much. So it was like I couldn't really count it as like peak time or mucus or I was just confused because you know I said okay, it's stretchy, it's clear, it's um slippery and all that but it just doesn't I couldn't pick it up from the toilet paper and mm-hmm. kind of put a finger test so that was the challenge and I and I once again this is really helping me and even though it, I know like you don't you know you don't discourage us if we're not doing well you actually try to cheer us up as much as you can and I love that about this I'm learning I mean even though it's it's challenging, but sometimes I feel ignorant because I'm like, this is my body. I should know better. <laughs> I wear this with me all the time, no. you know? So I, I sometimes I feel ashamed. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to ask these questions. That's why sometimes I guess I don't ask that many questions because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> well, I mean, whenever you ask a question, there's at least two other ladies in the group that have the same one. So I know that just from experience. And I mean, there's two aspects of this that are challenging. The most challenging part of it sometimes is that your observations don't match your expectations. So sometimes that's the hardest part. So on that day that you saw the, you had the observation, so it was slippery, it was clear and stretchy, but you couldn't take a, uh, pick up a whole lot off of the toilet paper. Did you only observe it once or did you observe it more than once throughout the day? I did twice. I noticed that once was early in the morning and one was close to the nighttime. Okay. Well, and so to to provide some reassurance. So, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that impact your ability to conceive. And I think in our group together, we talked about a lot of them in our different hot seat sessions with all the other ladies. So, I mean, in order to conceive, you have to have a healthy body, you know, you have to have healthy mucus, healthy sperm, but there's all these other things that have to be happening. So if everything else was completely fine, perfect sperm, no other kind of health challenges, even if you only have like, even if you have a day where you have mucus, but it's not a whole lot, like the quantity isn't there, uh, Mm -hmm. you can still get pregnant. So I've seen charts of women who have no peak mucus. Say, for example, I've one of my clients only in our time together, we worked together for a really long time. It was like a year. She only ever had non-peak mucus, meaning that her mucus was only ever like cl- like cloudy, like uh, lotion. Mm-hmm. And when she was ready to try to conceive, she got pregnant from having sex on her mucus day, even though it wasn't peak. 
So I just want to put that out there. And I've also worked with women who I've worked with a few clients who have never had an observation of mucus that they could stretch between their fingers. So on their days of mucus, they would only like their only observation of the mucus would be like a, a lubricative sensation. So they're wiping and it feels super slippery. There's not really anything there that they can pick up. So it's like a, you know, maybe the toilet paper shiny or something like that, but it is a lubricative sensation. And again, I've had clients conceive because, so for the purpose of timing, when it comes to fertility awareness, what's important isn't how much you have, like in, in terms of identifying your fertile window and figuring out which days to have sex on. It's, it's about like which day it's on. <laughs> so as yeah. long as there's mucus there, then it means that you're in your fertile window. It means that your cervix is open. It means that, you know, sperm will survive in there. I mean, obviously, yes, it's ideal to have, you know, at least one day of your cycle where you have mucus that you can test between your fingers. It's clear and stretchy, you know, like a couple of times, like to see it about four more times a day. Like, yes, that's optimal. But I just want to say that you don't need to have like gobs and loads of mucus to, to conceive. And so there are times when, when you're not conceiving and it's not necessarily because you don't have enough mucus. You, do you, I hope you see what I'm like, the point I'm trying to make there. Yeah, I'm following your lead. Yeah, I am okay. following. <laughs> but so to answer your question, I mean, one of the things that I encouraged, I think I encouraged you to do, I think in one of our sessions was to try, and I, let me just see. So we have one full chart together. And one of the things that I would encourage you right. to do, maybe you've been doing it and not noting it. So let me know. But one of the things I, I would encourage you to do is check for mucus on, you know, outside of your fertile window. So on your dry days. So did you do that? Like on your dry days, is the toilet paper like totally dry? Uh, no, I have actually in between. There's days that I'm dry. There's days that I like it's damp, but nah. It's just damp. Nothing that you can just pick up and identify whether it's clear or is other color. It's just damp. Okay. And is it damp consistently? Like, is it like when you're wiping and it's not like you've identified that it's not? So it's not like pee or anything. So I guess let me rephrase the question. So when you're like before you go to the bathroom, if you wipe, is it usually damp? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. And so one of the, I mean, I talk about cervical health a lot on the podcast. And so one of the things that I'm looking for is that type of an observation. It's not uncommon. I've seen it quite a bit. And some of uh, the women that I've worked with who have a limited production of cervical mucus tend to also have this regular damp observation. And so that could mean that we have to look into your cervical health. So Daisy, tell me when the last time you had a pap. That was actually June, 2018. I suppose what I would want to see, Daisy, from your chart is I'd want to see like a kind of one more chart. And I would encourage you to check on your dry days just to see if they're really dry or if they're damp and if that's consistent. Because if that's the case, that could be related to why you're not seeing as much mucus. So like the first thing to answer your question of what can I do to improve my mucus production? I mean, there's lots of different factors that can play into it. But if we're seeing a regular kind of damp observation on what are supposed to be your dry days, then what we'd want to do is support your cervix. Okay. Uh, one thing just to add, putting this away a little bit, but it's related to. While I was on the birth control pills, the doctor told me that one of the pap smear started to come. Uh, it was abnormal. And they they diagnosed me with the HPV infection. So I was dealing with this. So I was getting a pap smear every, every three months okay. just to make sure everything was fine. But then that was for at least three years. I was just on the watch. Now, like, I never had any reaction, any uh, flare-ups or anything. I, It was normal. Um, as my lifestyle was normal, that was normal. But just the doctor wanted me to be, you know, on the watch. After I, be, I came out of the birth control pills, when I got my pap smear, I never got that back. I, my, my pap smear, they always came back normal. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, birth control, hormonal birth control is associated with an increased risk of not catching it, but of, of having an HPV infection that won't go away. Mm -hmm. So it's really common to have an abnormal pap, unfortunately. 
and to like, it's, it's just really common. I know I've posted about that before and people say, people ask like, well, what do you mean? How could the pill be associated with HPV? It's a virus, but it's associated because your body's less able to just get rid of it and fight it off. So, I mean, one of the things that you could, that you could do Daisy, I suppose, moving forward is like for the net, like, so you're, you just had your period. Is that right? Let me go back to your chart. Um, yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not sure where you are in your chart. Yeah, I think, yeah, because we have it updated until last week. But what I would encourage you to do, and I mean, especially because you're also working with your NAPRO doctor, is to, to really pay attention to those observations on your dry days. Like, so I know that this is something that's super common among my, among my clients who are trying to conceive, but it's super common to you know, really focus on the charting when you're in your fertile window and then outside of it, it's like, well, what's the point? (laughs) So, but we want to pay attention to your cervical health. As soon as you have concerns about your cervical mucus production, and if you're regularly seeing those type of damp observations, we want to pay attention to what we're seeing. So on your dry days, I want you to check for mucus as much as you can. We don't go for perfection here, but because it's not a real thing, but I just want you to, to, to have that in the back of your mind that you're going to watch on your dry days and try to think of what you're seeing. So is it dry, completely dry? Is it shiny? Is it damp on those days where it's when you're wiping and it feels dry? And then what we're going to do is look for patterns. And if you're seeing that dampness throughout your cycle and you're kind of experiencing that regularly, then we know that your cervix may need a little bit of additional support. And so in that case, you're going to, you know, you can consider adding some folate to the mix. So folate is really important for cervical health, and it's been shown to reverse abnormal cells. I suppose that gives you an idea of, for the, like, so there's two aspects of it. One is that, you know, keep in mind that even though you don't see a lot, you knowing how to identify when you're in your fertile window, like even if all the, the only sign that you're seeing is a lubricative sensation and that shininess on the, the toilet paper, that's yeah. still a fertile day. So there's no like, technically, there's no such thing it's as nothing. more fertile or less fertile. It's just fertile. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I guess that, I guess it triggers your brain because you're thinking about this, you know, example that you guys give about cervical mucus and how it is what color and like before you said we're so different and you really like gave me that I will say the confidence when you said before that there's certain people that you have worked with and they have experienced their the kind of mucus they guys a little different than the others and they still got pregnant so I it, it gives me the different view now when I come to charting because I am not like expecting to see that perfect, clear, stretchy finger tested, you know, whatever size. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of like, I, I totally shift my, my view now. So thank well, you. Well, helpful. you're welcome. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways to look at it, but I think it's really important to note that not all women experience abundant clear, stretchy mucus. Some women never really have that. And there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, in what I, from what I've seen, just working with women over the past several years, is that if I'm working with someone that doesn't see, and like basically like doesn't ever really see any mucus that they can pick up, there's typically a reason for it. So whether it is a cervical health issue, like we were talking about, or a, a history of hormonal birth control use, uh, especially if it's recent history. So if they've just come off, not every woman has that experience. So some women come off and they see lots of mucus, but other women come off and they really don't see any for a little bit. And then uh, another example is women who actually did have, similar to you, Daisy, a diagnosis of HPV or something that was more invasive and they had to have some sort of treatment done to their cervix. So perhaps they had like a colposcopy or some sort of procedure that was done to remove those abnormal cells. And in, in that case, I've also seen women who've been through that surgery have less mucus. The listeners can't see this, but I just pulled up a, a lovely picture of a cervix for you. <laughs> Um, And the reason I did that is just to, I just want to show you this concept of what I'm saying about 
technically there's no such thing as more fertile or less fertile. It's just fertile. Like you're either fertile or you're not. And part of the reason is because this whole purpose of, of charting, especially with the focus on mucus, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out when your cervix is open and when it's closed. Like that's the whole point of this. So when you have mucus, you know, in your pre-ovulatory phase, so before ovulation, regardless of what color it is, how much there is, <laughs> having mucus before ovulation is an indication that you're moving towards ovulation. Right. And when you see mucus and when you have that lubricative, like slippery feeling when you're wiping, uh, when you go to the bathroom, that means your cervix is open. And as long as your cervix is open, that means sperm can swim in there. And, and obviously, it means that you're in your fertile window. So let me just refresh my memory as we, because I just want to make sure we kind of cover our bases here. I think we've spoken about this before. Yes, we did. <laughs> I'm sure we have. I just want to double check with you. In your case, you have a lot of challenges. So I could see the, the complete focus being on you. Right. <laughs> so has your partner been tested for his sperm quality? I think, uh, I think feel like we talked about this. Yes, we did. But uh, oh my God, you got so many people. I don't expect you to remember everything. We did, but that was four years ago. And obviously they said it was under the normal count. But you know, like you said before, something is not such a thing as like normal. Like you always have to read the whole, I guess. But they they said he was under the normal count at that time? Yes. Okay. So, I mean... In your situation, it's it's kind of hard because you have all of these kind of obvious challenges. Like you've got the super painful periods, you've got all this stuff going on. And so it's easy to just forget that part. Like, yeah. so there's two people involved. And but I, I just won now. <laughs> and it's so, and it's entirely possible. So in most cases of, so like kind of backing it up to the statistics, so, you know, 40% of the time infertility is related to male factor. So almost half of the time it's it's on his side. So although you do have challenges, there are women that have challenges with their cycles and still conceive. There are women that have super painful periods that still conceive. So I think that's something that I would suggest, like it's been on the back burner. Four years is a long time and sperm can change. And yeah. uh, if you do the test and you identify, well, first of all, you did the test and they said his sperm count was low. So that's a flag. (laughs) But if you were to do the test today and then you were to discover that there was an issue with his sperm, it can take anywhere from like four to six months to see improvement by kind of focusing on for him to focus on like seeing a a practitioner, focus on supplementation, diet, lifestyle, like identify any of the factors that could be contributing to the low sperm. And it just so happened in our group that a few of the the ladies experienced just this exact thing. And we talked about it quite a bit in our 10-week program. There's certain medications that can negatively impact sperm production. And unless they had done that test and made the connection with the medication, they would have had no idea that that medication could have had an impact on the sperm. So as much as I want to, you know, focus on you, Daisy, I think that maybe we need to focus just to double check across the T's dot the I's because it could be like, it could be a contributing factor for him. You're right. Honestly, I've I've been putting everything on on top of my shoulders because I feel like I'm the one that I was not able to do. And I kind of discourage all of that. But you're right. You do have a strong point when it comes to, it should be more proactive that the two of us get into this little pad because at the end of the day, we need the two of us to be healthy, to have a baby. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, I I always say this. So any of the listeners who've listened to like lots and lots of episodes, they've heard me say this, but this is not about laying blame, but it's, it's about addressing the issue. I mean, just the way that our world is, how it's oriented, anything to do with fertility and pregnancy, the assumption, even I've had clients who's who's a fertility specialist, who they have to kind of cajole to get them to test their partners because the assumption is that it's her. Right. And we are actually in the midst of a sperm crisis. There's a lot of research that very clearly shows the declining trend of sperm quality. So if you were to take your average man in 1940 or 1950 and your average man today, they have half or less of the sperm count 
And it's yeah. not me saying this, it's the actual literature, years and years and years of research. So there's an actual huge, massive problem on the male side where sperm counts are steadily declining. Morphology, sperm quality, sperm motility are all going down. So there's less and less in general, in total, and then there's fewer that are normal and capable of doing anything. Wow. And, um, and I just saw, <laughs> I think, yeah, it was Laura Bryden. So I follow her in, on social media. And she just posted like two articles back to back. And it was about how there's an issue with sperm quality. Mm-hmm. And the solution is IVF. So meaning that there's an issue with men. And instead of figuring out how to fix the men, women have to go through IVF, right? Because if, right. if yes. your partner's sperm is really low, the only solution is for them to put you through IVF like from the allopathic medical perspective, right? right? So, so anyways, this is like, I'm going to come down off the soapbox, Daisy, but you can see what I'm saying. Like, Uh, and I'm particularly concerned because you told me that they told you that his sperm count was low to begin with. And that was four years ago. You know, I wouldn't really rule it out. I really will definitely consider that. And I think it's, it's, it's wise for the two of us to be in the same pad. Like I said before, Sometimes, you know, things happen. Lifestyle stress could really minimize a lot of things and change and so drastically in our bodies. So I, I don't think I will hold myself from it. But as now, I did say, I'm going to prepare myself, my body. But I think it's time for him also to to get his, 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 his you know, input into this situation as well. Yeah. And the worst that can happen is that he does the test. And the doctor's like, wow, you've got like zillions of amazing sperm. And then right. you're like, oh, that, that, kind of, that's, you know what I mean? Like, oh, that was a waste of an afternoon, but that's really no, good. That's like a worry. great, yes, that's no. a great downside because there's no downside to just checking that out. So before we wrap up our session today, Daisy, we, you know, we went through a bit, we talked a little bit about cervical mucus, but did you have any final thoughts, comments, questions, or any other kind of burning questions that you wanted to address on the call? Well, I touch up a little bit. I left out uh, about endometriosis that I have. That's something new that I'm learning about it. I really don't know much. I That's something I really need to get deep and learn more. I know it takes diet, exercise, stress, minimize the stress and all these things that it kind of like helps to avoid any type of inflammation in the, in the body and all that. That's something that it really is, is I need to, to get a little more of that information. And um, I don't know that many people that they have gone and done surgery or what's the story like afterwards or how did they get pregnant when they have, well, you know, once dealing with this. So, there's a lot of questions. It's just right now, I know it's, we don't have the time, but that's something that I always, I'm still learning and I, I would like to know more about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult situation because I know you have, you're considering doing surgery because when you described your pain to me, I mean, it sounded like, yeah, it was, high. yeah, it was really, painful. really high, really painful. And over the years, you were trying to deter, like, so one doctor diagnosed you with PCOS, but then you started to wonder if that's really what was going on. And then since they suspect that it's endometriosis, and so you'll get that, like, positive diagnosis if you do the surgery. I would say, I mean, given everything that you've experienced, I think that when you do have serious acne the way you had it, serious pain the way you've experienced it, there's obviously some underlying factors there, underlying hormonal issues, possible gut issues. And I think that in your case, you need to have someone in your corner. So in our final session together uh, of our 10-week program, one of the things that we talked about was stacking your healthcare team. I think it's, it's easy to assume, especially because women's issues like menstrual cycle issues are kind of minimized and kind of swept under the rug. So I think it's really easy to assume that like, all I got to do is like, cut out dairy and everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, we often think that it's, (laughs) yeah, like, we often think that it's just going to like a couple dietary changes and like two supplements and everything will be fine. But 
I mean, depending on the severity of the issue, depending on the severity of the problem, you really often bet like you can really benefit from having someone to support you. The hard part is that every practitioner specializes in a different area. So not all doctors specialize in fertility, not all naturopaths specialize in endometriosis, for example. You know, so it the the hardest part about it is having the patience and the wherewithal to kind of go through some of those unhelpful appointments and sometimes you go see somebody and you're really excited but then they don't turn out to you know specialize in the area that you need and it can be really frustrating so you know I'm not sure what's possible for you where what's available to you with uh, within your area but I would say that it's it's a good idea to especially when you're dealing with fertility challenges endometriosis and you have a desire to address it in a more holistic way so I think it's helpful to try to have more than one practitioner on your side, if possible. So you're seeing an APRO doctor, which I mean, it's a, that's a really fantastic, <laughs> especially when you have, you know, knowing that. So for those of you who are, I should have defined this earlier. So, but those of you who are listening, who are like, what the heck is an APRO doctor? So an APRO technology is, it's a, a mode of practice where doctors actually incorporate menstrual cycle charting into what they're doing. And so if they're going to do hormone tests or if they're going to check to see if you're ovulating normally, they're going to base it on your chart and actually identify what stage of your cycle you're in. So it's kind of like the perfect world of, <laughs> of medical care. Right. Um, yeah, we to <laughs> well, and if anyone wants to learn more about it, there's a, a couple of episodes that I'll link in the show notes page. I think I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. So I will link two previous episodes on that just in case anyone wants to to hear more. So you've kind of got the medical side covered is what I'm saying, but you may want to consider the other side. So if you're wanting to figure out like what exactly should I be eating? How exactly should I be addressing this? Like, are there specific supplements that can reduce the immune issues that are causing my uterine lining to grow outside of my uterus, <laughs> which is the case right. in endometriosis. If there are gut issues or if there are other types of issues that could be contributing, maybe considering if there's anything, any any other supportive practitioners in your area. Naturopathic doctors who specialize in endometriosis specifically, or acupuncturists, traditional Chinese medicine doctors who specifically focus on that area. A lot of women, and there's a lot of research about acupuncture as reducing some of that inflammation and reducing pain associated with menstruation. So some women have a great deal of success with some of these by having more than one practitioner on their team, if you know what I mean. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, this is not something we're going to be able to solve in a one hour call, Um, but I would really encourage you to consider, first of all, doing some research, what, who's available in your area. And it's not just about finding a practitioner with a certain designation. It's about finding a practitioner who specializes in that specific area. So in your specific condition and also aligns with your perspective on how you want to be supported. Correct. Yes. And this is like a learning experience and it's a process. I have to say, um, it, this, has, this really has allowed me to put myself together in so many ways that even though it's challenging, but at the same time, uh, I'm so grateful because I learned to appreciate and love my body in a way that I never did before. And, you know, regardless of the challenge that I know only God knows why things happen, how they happen. But uh, I think the best way to go, like you said, is working with a team that they can help me to to tackle all these and, and do it just the right way. Because sometimes you think, oh, I want to save us some money or I don't have the time. Sometimes you could do things that it could be harming you, you know. And uh, once again, you need someone that does and specialist or has a higher education on this that it can guide you through because it will make it so much easier. At first, it's, of course, it's expensive, but it's your life, it's your health that is on the blank. So yeah, thank you. You're right. Well, you're welcome. It's hard. There's no easy answer. Um, right. And fertility, it's it's even harder. Uh, sometimes I think about it and it's it's like you're hesitant to to, you know, to, to spend the money on a functional practitioner who specializes in that area, for example. But IVF is also really expensive. And so like even more expensive, right? So 
and there's and it's hard because there's no guarantees but the way that i look at the menstrual cycle kind of the foundation of my teaching and the reason that i do this at all is that when you're experiencing menstrual cycle issues it is an indication of an underlying factor so i feel like we're still in the infancy of women's health because so many practitioners don't necessarily specialize in it and it can take a lot of time because i mean many women have had the similar experience i know i have where you go to a doctor and you, you know you have an issue with your cycle and you're asking about it and you're not getting any answers. Like you're just getting prescriptions for things, but you're not getting any answers. So, and some of us can even get to the point where we don't even want to go to see anybody anymore because they don't know anything. Right. But I think that the, I mean, maybe I'm just too hopeful, but I've been, you know, after all these years interviewing all these professionals, I do know that there are people out there who do specialize in these areas and can help you. And it, the hard part is, is kind of taking the time to find them. Right. And yeah. to, to not be totally disenfranchised with the whole process when you have a bad appointment with somebody. Right. Like you got to yeah. keep because because when you do find and construct the right team of practitioners to support you, you can at least make some headway, you know, get to the bottom of these issues and really get what you need. You feel like you're not alone anymore. You That's feel right. like no one out there is really understanding and seeing your issues you know mm -hmm. and you're right it's, it's overwhelming it's, it's a headache sometimes because like you just said before you know how many times I switch over to UIS because I was not pleased with them and that was just like rule me out like okay here's a uh, ibuprofen 800 milligrams always oh, normal is your period like it came to a point that they, they really one of my doctors told me that I need to go to see a psychiatrist <sighs> I'm doing my head. more deep breathing, Daisy. I, <laughs> I do a lot of that. <laughs> I know, so I said, okay, you know what? Okay, yeah, let me. It's in your head, right? That's what. Let me just be cuckoo thought. then, and but I'll be cuckoo, and I'm gonna learn, and I'm gonna spread the word. <laughs> well, I I don't know. I do believe that as more women speak out, as more women become aware, just you know, as more women recognize that um, the menstrual cycle is a sign of health, pain is not normal demand treatment, demand care. And, you know, if your doctor tells you to go to a psychiatrist because they don't believe that the pain is real, get a new doctor, right? Like you can do that. You can be like, okay, and you're fired and I'm going to find a better doctor. Not to, I don't want to put down doctors because there's people no. in every profession, right? But I, at the end of the day, you have the right to step away. Just like if you were at McDonald's or something, bad example, but I'm going to go with it still. Or getting and like, a haircut. You're like, hey, I want to get a burger. And the person starts like, well, you're just a lunatic. Well, you're not going to like go to that person. You're going to leave. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so as we bring this session to a close, Daisy, for any woman who's listening, um, maybe even who resonates with your story, who has maybe experienced something similar, what, if anything, would you want to say to her? Oh, wow. The first thing I will say, learn. Knowledge is power. Never listen to someone that's telling you that you're wrong. Just go and investigate. Get yourself the right help. And there's always hope. And if you have faith and, you know, God will make sure the right people come to your path and they will walk you by the hand and you'll get what you need to get. But just knowledge is power. That's all I'm saying. Well, and for someone who's thinking about learning fertility awareness, maybe they're considering taking the 10-week program. What would you want them to know about this whole process? I would call it like it's magical because you learn about the temple that God gave you. And I'm not religious. I just really feel this. I'm very spiritual. But it was such a great class because I got to interact and learn things that I never thought I was going to get exposed to. And, you know, the knowledge that I got is, wow, it's incredible how I live in this body for 34 years and I just started to learn how to function. <laughs> I, if I, if I will be able to provide it for a friend, I will definitely hardly recommend it because it's, you got to invest on yourself and this is the great way that you can learn about yourself. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here, Daisy. So thank keep you. us posted. Let me know, let us know how it all goes and how it all turns out. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. 
You'll find the show notes page for this episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 222. So I just want to say a special thank you to Daisy for coming on the show and being so open and vulnerable with your story. I know that these episodes are favorite for most of my clients. These are their favorite episodes, the on-air client sessions, uh, because even though we're talking about similar topics, often, you know, different aspects of fertility awareness come up. And of course, every woman has different challenges that she's facing. Uh, So I think it's really common to be concerned about cervical mucus production because a lot of women struggle to see it. And I think that in part that's due to just the collective use of hormonal birth control as that can have a negative impact on your cervical mucus production, especially when you're first coming off of it. But there's a lot of other factors that I've seen. And so I think the important takeaway from today's episode is that when you're looking at identifying the right time to to have sex when you're trying to conceive, the amount of mucus doesn't really play into the timing aspect. So regardless of how much you see, it's really important to know that that's still how you identify uh, which days are the best to conceive. And so I think I was, you know, I was really excited to have a chance to chat about that because I'm not sure how much we've talked about on the podcast, but it's really important to remember the amount doesn't really matter when it comes to timing. (laughs) And so for those of you who are wondering, you know, when are the best days to have sex, especially when you're actively trying to conceive, I think it's really helpful to know that it's your days of mucus, regardless of how much you see. One of the other takeaways from today's episode with Daisy is that every woman's cycle is different and not every woman sees the exact same thing. And even if what you're seeing isn't exactly what the textbook shows, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have trouble conceiving. And I think that that's really important because there's so many different variations and there's so many different reasons why women see different things. So whether we're talking about cervical mucus production and how much we're seeing, or whether we're talking about cervical position or the texture and feel of your cervix, every woman doesn't have the same experience. And so I think that's one of the reasons why uh, cervical mucus is so challenging, cervical position is so challenging, because many women's, what they're seeing, their signs just do not match (laughs) what the book says, or, you know, what you're seeing in different sources, whether you're online or reading different books. It's, It's hard because we're all different. I mean, there's common threads, of course, or we wouldn't be able to actually do the fertility awareness method, but every woman does have some subtle differences. So if you find that you're having some challenges organizing all of this and figuring out what the heck to do with your cervical mucus observations or your basal body temperature, cervical position, or any of the other aspects to fertility awareness charting, make sure to join us in the 10-week fertility awareness mastery group program. So we're starting October 9th, so it's right around the corner if you're listening in real time. And so make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash group program and apply today to make sure we have a spot for you. So at the time I'm recording this, I still have spaces available in the group. So there are limited spots available because there's only so many women that I can put in a group. So if you want to make sure we reserve your spot, uh, make sure to apply. Don't hesitate. Uh, At this time, like I said, we still have a few spots left. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash group program. And I just want to thank you again for being part of the Fertility Friday community, for sharing the show with your friends, really spreading the word about body literacy and fertility awareness. It's so important. And I hear just every day, whenever I'm speaking with clients, whenever I'm interacting with women who are part of the community and in whatever way, shape or form we're interacting, I just hear it so often. Thank you for sharing this important information with women. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And ultimately, I mean, that's what this is all about. It's about empowering each of us with the knowledge of our body and our fertility so that we can make informed decisions about our health and also our fertility. And so it's so important as women because this is information that we're just not taught. So we're taught all kinds of stuff in school, but we're not taught just the very basics of how to identify which days we can get pregnant on and (laughs) how many days of the cycle we can actually get pregnant. And also, you know, what are some of those side effects of, of the different birth control that are so common and popular? So those are some of the things that we're not taught about. And that's why it's so important that we just continue to spread the word about fertility awareness and body literacy. So I really appreciate you for being part of this community. And so with that said, until next time, be well and happy charting.